By now, I imagine some of you are getting sick of this because this is God knows. Like, it's basically like the channel's just become rolling rambles, hasn't it? Oh, uh, well, here we go again with yet another one. This one is a little different again. I was thinking that maybe it is time. Maybe I should just go into monk mode and buckle down and just make making a new system that's not Windows, Mac OS, Linux, or any of the much lesser and rarely used alternatives. That's right, BSD people, I snubbed you. What are you going to do about it? Uh, but maybe I should make an OS. Maybe I should make software. Maybe I should start a project to replace all the modern solutions with something better. And everything is pushing me in that direction. And I do mean everything. Um, I have gotten a lot of at least verbal support from several of you, in fact, whenever I mentioned, you know, uh, why, why don't we just, you know, make, someone needs to just make an alternative system that isn't bound by these existing monstrous monoliths. And it's very difficult, but uh, it just seems like at this point, people are practically begging for something new, something that they can go to and get their work done, but that doesn't suck and that doesn't try to inhale all of their data and just generally abuse them. Um, what Lewis Rossman affectionately calls the rapist mentality, where they, uh, they get you to agree to a 3,000 page contract and then somewhere buried in the contract they have like, oh, by the way, down here on page 749, where you'll never actually see it or read it, because no one can read this stupid legalese contract that's this insanely long, understand it, and thus meaningfully consent to it, we, uh, we, we get to siphon up all your data, do whatever we want with it, uh, make money off of it, pretty much just, you know, you are a data cow and we will milk you, as I said in a previous video. Moo, you are a cow. It's, um, <laughs> I think it's a better way of putting what they used to say um, about how if, if you're getting something for free, then you're the product, you know? Um, if you're getting something and you're not paying for it, you are the product. That's, that's the way they put it. And here's the thing that's kind of spurred me to make this video in particular. There is a browser for Serenity OS, which is one of those small hobbyist OSs that has, uh, I think I think it's one guy behind it, um, but that's come an amazing way, and they just got a million dollars from the founder of GitHub to hire a bunch of, a bunch more developers and build this thing out. And before that, they got like 125 grand to develop this. So there'll be an alternative to Mozilla Firefox. You know, Mozilla, the social justice warrior infested corporation that spends all its time and money on AI, puts sponsor crap all up in your browser, uh, and just generally, uh, the, they treat you like a cow, even though they're all like, we're all about the free and open web, and uh, we care about everybody being able to take advantage of technology and have access and all this other but really they are they're just milking you for data and money um, spending it all on bullshit uh, you know just like the Linux Foundation the gnome Foundation just all of it they, they just they're spending all this money that's supposed to go to open source software on bullshit you can see my previous exceedingly long ramble if you um, if you really want to hear more about that but that's not what this video is about this video is about me going, if some guy can build up a browser prototype to the point that some investor will give him 125 grand, and then not much longer after that, another investor will give him eight times that much, why can't I? Why can't I do it? If you go looking at osdev.org, for example, and try to understand how to write your own operating system. Um, if you are a remotely rational person, 
you will come away from that website understanding that you can't uh, because it is extremely difficult to write an operating system. Um, it is very easy, as with many things, to write an extremely simple operating system that doesn't run anything and that can barely do anything. It's nowhere near as simple to write a functional operating system that is able to communicate with several different pieces of hardware that can, uh, I mean, this is the thing, it, it could take, it could take weeks just to get to the point where you can communicate with disks. Just as an example, um, the number of aspects to an operating system kernel, not what we call an operating system, which really is like a whole operating environment, but just the kernel itself, the core program at the heart of any operating system that provides all the services to all the other parts of the system. Just writing that is way beyond a single person uh, in general. Now, my understanding is Serenity OS is, is a project of one guy and more people sign on eventually, uh, just like Linux was. Now, Linux came about, and um, keep in mind, Windows and Mac OS, same deal. All of these systems came about in an era when computing was much more simple. The uh, origins of MS-DOS, which before MS-DOS, it was actually QDOS. Microsoft bought QDOS, turned it into MS-DOS 1, uh, which didn't even have folders, directories. It, it was just a flat disk. Um, same thing with the Commodore 64, too, actually. The file system on these disks, on these floppy disks, the capacity was limited, and they didn't have folders or anything. They, you could not make a hierarchy of files. It was just a, a flat list of files. Because the truth is, you couldn't put that many files on a 170 kilobyte side of a floppy disk in the first place, or 180, or whatever it is, depending on your machine. So. If you can't put that much on there in the first place, there's not much of a point in adding the complexity of directories. We are talking about machines that were 8 and 16-bit. Uh, um, DOS was based on a 16-bit architecture, but Commodore's 8. Um, actually, Commodore, fun fact, Commodore, Atari, the Nintendo Entertainment System, um, and some of the Atari computers all and and the Super Nintendo 16-bit variant um, all use the 6502 processor. So all of those systems were basically the same thing. Uh, oh come on, uh, bling bling goes the stupid thing. So all of the existing systems um, came about. Well, let's see what's today. It's 2024. This year is 2024, and. All of the existing systems are, what's the newest one? I mean, arguably Mac OS X is the newest one, but it actually existed before it was OS X. It was called Next Step, and Next Step was a BSD. <coughs> but Mac OS X didn't start from scratch, excuse me. <coughs> God almighty. I got a little throat tickle there, I apologize. Mac OS X did not start from scratch. The ones that basically started from scratch were MS-DOS. Um, although he bought QDOS, it was not a complete system. They did actually have to do a ton of work to get that to be a complete system. Um, and then the, uh, let's see, most of the early 8-bit machines didn't even have an operating system to speak of. It was just some stuff burned into some ROMs, and that was it. Uh, but MS-DOS and then Mac OS, the original Macintosh operating system. That's like, what, the early 80s? All of this stuff originated in the early 80s. Um, I think Linux would actually be the newest contender in the bunch, because BSD technically goes back, I think, to the 70s. I don't think it goes as far back as the 60s, but I don't know Unix that far back anyway. So... Linux is arguably the newest operating system on the block. There are BSD variants, but um, Linux dates back to 1991 when Torvalds put it together, and I think he posted it publicly in 91. I don't remember, but early 90s. So we've got 24, 30, it, it's like 32 years 
that Linux has been a thing out there on the internet for people to use. And it's probably been about 30 years since it was a thing that not only people could use, but was actually really useful um, and started to replace other systems. It was, I think, 90, was it 94, 95 that Apache Web Server came out and became Linux's killer app that made it replace tons of servers and kind of spawned the rise of the World Wide Web on the internet and, and, and all that stuff. Like, I think the internet revolution was basically paved by Linux plus Apache Web Server. Uh, but we're talking about technology that is so old that it can rent a car. In the U.S., um, nobody will rent a car to you if you're under 25 outside of certain special circumstances. Uh, but generally, they won't rent you a car if you're under 25, um, which is a bit nutty. But it's so old it could rent a car in the U.S., over 30 years old. Um, and there have been a lot of mistakes made along the way. I have covered uh, one minor aspect that I think was a mistake in excruciating, painful, I can't believe I'm listening to this guy talk about it detail, but there are a lot more. Um, there are a lot of things that a lot of developers have said they would change about how they did it if they could. The problem is once a system is established, it gains momentum. And it is difficult to take that system and fix it. I, I discussed this in my video where I was talking about technical debt. This is what we call technical debt. You make a wrong decision early on, a whole lot of the system ends up being built around this error, around this bad choice. And to fix the bad choice means pulling more things apart. It's like if you get a house built and you don't have it inspected when it's supposed to be while it's being built, the inspector will make you rip all the drywall out, rip off all the fixtures, tear down the tile. You know, it, you'll have to just tear the whole thing apart until you get down to the part that needed to be inspected, get the inspection, and then put it back together at great time and expense. So it is in the software world as well. None of you are sitting there going, I am actually going to get, dig my hands into the Linux kernel, the, C, the GNU C library, um, and every program on my system and modify it to fix this perceived mistake from the past. So one of the things that I have done recently is I started experimenting. I actually, I, I, I admit I've looked at almost none of the code in the GNU C library, glibc. And recently I started looking at it and I started hacking it. I, I had to learn a lot of things about it uh, that I didn't know before and that I thought might be a little easier than they were. But ultimately what I did was I hacked the GNU C library to add a call a system, or not a system call, but a library call uh, called get namlen. So if you remember from my previous video, I said one of the biggest mistakes was using a record length instead of a file name length. Not passing the file name length causes this work to be redone and it kind of cascades to a lot of other things. And you might have something that, um, some file name whose length gets, you know, basically calculated over and over and over again a very slow operation in computing terms, um, and you multiply it by a lot of files, it can in, it can invoke or incur quite a bit of compute overhead. So I experimented by taking my copy of my little function in libjody code that derives, um, basically shortcuts the string length calculation, um, derives that from the uh, the record length, because the record length is aligned, so you actually have to figure out where the, the last character is, but it can skip over the first chunks of it. So I modified the C library to add this call, and I modified a couple of other things in the C library to use it, and I tried to modify the core, uh, the, the GNU find utils command find to take advantage of it, and I, I succeeded in doing this. Um, I confirmed that the output was correct, everything worked fine, and I ran a massive amount of iterations of find with my modified um, 
with my modified call and just I, I, I built a C library I actually have a change root system that I put it in but I test it against my new library that I built um, and against the existing one on the system my new library with this new call running find like a thousand times over the same you know little pile of folders or whatever um, I was able to achieve a, a modest performance gain of something to the tune of 0.1%. So that was a little disappointing. Unfortunately, that's it's a gain, but it's a gain that could have come from the library just being built with a different version of the compiler or different flags. You know, maybe I built mine in a slightly different way than the people who built mine. And you know, the proper thing to do would probably be just to take the library, build it twice, once with and once without, and, you know, test that way. But the bottom line is the gain over just an existing library was so small, and I don't know that it was worth it, but I think more testing is in order. I don't, I don't know that Find does a very good job of actually making use of that length internally. Sometimes you have to do more than just pass the length along so that it doesn't get calculated. Sometimes there are things that have to be changed. I mean, just, just passing the length along is one thing, but um, some things will still use a string copy even if they know the length. So, yeah, you get the idea. Um, I got a little in the weeds on that. I apologize. Moving back to... Uh, ooh, I got bright. What happened there? Um, moving back to something a little bit more close to the topic. Um, this Ladybird browser gets a bunch of money. Um, you guys clearly are salivating at the mouth at the thought of something that's not Windows, not Mac OS, and probably not Linux, although a lot of you insist that Linux is just great as it is, and I just need to use Dolphin, the file manager for KDE, and all my problems will be solved. Um, kind of... Uh, kind of sucks that I can't look at it right now. Um, I may not have time for a little while, so yes, I've heard your insistence that Dolphin is as good as Windows File Explorer, if not better, um, but I haven't had time to test it, so you will hear from me whenever I do. This is not that time. But there is no arguing against the notion that Linux has become a big, bloaty, inefficient thing, just like Windows just like Mac OS. And a lot of this problem stems from the fact that developers are, um, software developers treat software like a gas. It can expand to fit its container. Efficiency is not important anymore. Um, we are in an era, this is July 1st, 2024 that I'm recording this. We are in an era where we are arguing over whether or not eight gigs of RAM is a sufficient amount for general purpose computing or you need 16 instead. We're in an era where Apple for months insisted that M1 Macs uh, are just Apple Silicon Macs are so much better at memory management than other things that 8 gigs on a Mac is like 16 gigs on a PC which is a blatantly obvious lie um, and, and people actually believing it just shows how stupid the average person can be. Unfortunately, if you make an alternative system, you have to appeal to those stupid people and convince them that moving from what they're on to something better is actually a good idea. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's astonishing to me that we even exist in this era. I, I think about what I've had in the past, and I don't understand it. So, <coughs> I had, um, I kind of grew up on old machines, and I understand that if you have this big, fancy graphics card that is really complicated, that the software that runs it is also inherently going to be a bit complicated. I understand that. I understand that if you got, if you like, let's say you restricted your OS artificially to only use like 64 megabytes of RAM, I understand that you're not exactly going to be able to process the kind of stuff that you would process with an RTX 4090 or whatever. I, I get that. I, I get that. I'm not saying that that's not the case. I'm not saying 
that there is no justification at all for the bloat. But I'm saying that there's a lot less justification for most of it than what they would have you believe. I'm saying that I shouldn't need eight gigabytes of RAM just to run Windows 11 and a browser, a web browser. I, I should not have to have that many resources to do something that is that simple. We are talking about running an operating system and a web browser. Now, yes, web browsers are arguably almost as complex as a small operating system by themselves. They have video rendering, audio rendering. They tend to support, you know, tens of protocols. Um, there's stuff like WebRTC. Um, there's just your classic HTML, CSS, JavaScript interpreter, the document object model stuff. Just there, there's a lot that goes into a browser, and I understand that. But let me put it to you this way. We didn't have browsers that required one gig of RAM in the mid-2000s. We just didn't. We, we, we just didn't. That, that just wasn't a thing. It, it was never a thing back then. We didn't need that much RAM to browse the internet on Firefox 3, okay? We didn't need that much RAM. Why not? Is it, the, is, it, is it the operating system or is it is it Firefox that changed? What changed? Well, it's both. It's both. First of all, a massive source of bloat came in through Windows 8 because in Windows 8 what they did is they forced the desktop window manager that was the engine for Windows Aero from Vista N7, the, uh, the pretty glassy hardware rendered interface, they forced the desktop window manager to be the thing that everything rendered through. I understand some of the rationale for it. That adds overhead. If your graphics card is not good enough, if you, especially if you're on a low-end system, that can actually make things worse. It introduces this dependency on the graphics card to do stuff that requires more work it's more compute power used one way or the other. It also means moving more information in and out of the memory of the graphics card. If you count the effects, it also means that either the graphics card is calculating these things on the fly or the computer's processor is. <clears throat> but even if the graphics card's calculating it on the fly, the processor still has to manage the animation of the effects. You know, maybe maybe the GPU blurs the shadow, you know, like you you draw a rectangle in memory and it blurs the the window shadow for you. Maybe maybe that's what it does. The sun is going to be right in my eye and that's 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 the only way that it can be. Um, but one way or the other, it's it's extra work on the part of the computer. I look at CPU benchmark. I see that some of the chips that were slow as dirt running Windows 8. And by that, I'm, I'm talking AMD A4s, e, E1s and E2s, um, even like AMD C50s, I think. You know, these early AMD APUs that were like single core or maybe, maybe dual core if you're lucky, but really, really slow machines. Like, like you'd almost wish you had a Celeron instead. These machines, the CPUs might be slow, but compared to like a Pentium 4, they're actually pretty fast. And on Pentium 4s, we were able to browse the web, we were able to play videos, we were able to play, I mean, now granted the videos were like DivX and other um, MPEG-4 prior to what we call MP4, which is really just H.264, AVC, um, but the, the earlier MPEG-4 video stuff, you know, you could play that on a Pentium 2 and it wouldn't even break a sweat. At least if it wasn't high resolution, which back then nothing was. So yeah, we were watching our uh, DVD rip uh, DivX MPEG-4 videos on our Pentium 2s and 3s back in the day, back in the mid 2000s, Pentium 4s, whatever. Um, and now, a processor with that same amount of power is so slow 
that it might take two minutes to boot even if it has a solid state drive. Did the, is it really the processor that's at fault or is it the bloat of the software? And ultimately it's the operating system. As an operating system has to do more things, it introduces more bloat. This is why I think we need a new system instead of trying to fix what we already have. Everything, on Windows there's compatibility layers to the moon, which is one of Windows' big selling points, that you can run 30-year-old software 95% of the time without a hitch on Windows. Uh, they got like 4% of the time it'll have a minor hitch, and then 1% of the time it won't work. <clears throat> so compatibility is a big deal on Windows. That, that's, that's like the whole selling point at this point, is that you can basically run anything you want. Unless it's like GarageBand or Logic Pro or Final Cut Pro or, you know, in any of the Apple-only products, you can basically do whatever you want on a PC at this point with Windows. Linux, the biggest problem is that um, you can't do anything you want because all of the solutions for, at least for graphical applications on Linux, um, all of the Linux application versions of, say, video editors, image editors, etc., um, they might be all right, but they're nowhere near the Windows Pro equivalents like Photoshop. Photoshop continues to be the boss application when it comes to this kind of thing. I need to boost the gain on this thing. It's just too dark. There we go. Photoshop is the boss. Premiere Pro is the boss. You know, you, you cannot replace them without adding to the amount of time it takes to get stuff done, unless you don't know how to use them in the first place, but even then, you know, Photoshop versus GIMP. It does take more time to get certain things done in GIMP, GIMP does not have a lot of features Photoshop does. I can't draw a circle in GIMP. I can make a circular selection and stroke the selection, but I'd invite you to do that. Go to GIMP, draw a circular selection, edit, stroke path, or stroke selection rather. The circle will not be circular. The, the anti-aliasing will not be correct. It will, it will do this weird thing where it gets all flattened out and chunky on the sides. It does not, you can't draw a shape in GIMP correctly. It, it's just the most ridiculous thing. It's like, that, that seems like such a simple thing. Why can't I draw a circle? Now, it's not as big of a deal if I need to draw a filled circle because the filled circle doesn't seem to have quite as much of an issue uh, because at least it's filled. And I can use a Gaussian blur to kind of hide the defect if I blur the edges enough but it's still not the same as just drawing a plain, clean, anti-aliased circle. It's just a circle, man. Why is it so hard to get a circle drawn in GIMP? Um, GIMP does not do the... Uh, anyway, I, I don't want to get too far down that either. That's not the point of this. The point of this is that there's so much that's established. There are so many ways to get things done, and so many of those ways to get things done are just not good. They're, they're riddled with problems. I think that we need to create a new system that learns from all the mistakes of all of these existing systems. There is a scooter bro right here, so I have to get over. It's dangerous for you out here. Take this and hands him a Zelda sword. But anyway, that, that is a really friggin' fast scooter, dude. You must have uncapped that 50cc bastard. Okay, anyway. Uh, sorry, I got distracted. You don't see what I call liquor sickles in the restricted access portion of a highway very often. Uh, anyway, what was I saying? New system. Need a new system because there's all these things in existing systems that just aren't good enough. Maybe if you're willing to pay for Photoshop, you can get something that's, quote, good enough. But it's still Photoshop. It still wants to enslave your mother and steal all of your art. And just, you know, it, it's, it, it, and it has a, and it forces you to pay for a year in advance or whatever. I just, it's nuts. You're still subject to a ton of abuse. There needs to be an open system that doesn't do that. And that's what I want to do. And this is kind of why I'm making this video, and I don't have a satisfying ending for it. Um, I don't know what to do. I really don't, because I think about it, and how do you plan 
something of this magnitude. This is not this is not the kind of thing where you just, you know, like go out and get a business loan for something that ultimately you're try not trying to make a bunch of money off of. I'm not I don't want to sell an OS. I want people to give me money to create and maintain a system that they don't have to pay for and thus doesn't abuse them. You know, but that's the thing is is I, I want I want unrestricted, you know, I want donations to carry no weight. I don't want to do a nonprofit. And I've looked into all sorts of aspects of this, so maybe I should go over them real fast. I've got maybe 15, 20 minutes left to talk, so let's talk. Um, as far as funding goes, where do you get the money? Um, but before that, how do you structure the business? Because make no mistake, it is a business venture. Um, I looked into nonprofits, and a nonprofit is a no-go. Um, certain corporate structures are a no-go. The reason being, um, mm, my neck is hurting. You, you have to have a board of directors that can vote you off the board. Any corporate structure that can kick out the founder is not acceptable to me. Um, I understand that the theory, in theory. A board of directors exists so that people who have different opinions and ideas or whatever um, can give input and come to agreements that compromise between them and thus theoretically produce the best result for the organization's mission. At least when it comes to nonprofits, that's the theory. In reality, what happens is um, you start a, a nonprofit or a corporation that has a board. You start this, and whoever's on that board can just vote you out. They can basically just say you're fired. You get kicked out of the company you started that was your idea, you had the mission for. And a lot of times they do it just so they can have access to whatever money you were getting. Just so they can basically pay themselves your money. Get rid of you and pay themselves. Um, a lot of times it's so that, that, I mean, look at what's happened over the past 15 years. Social justice warriors and cancel culture and, and all the wokies and left hard, you know, and I don't care. If you're a leftist, fine. Just understand I'm not directly insulting you. I'm insulting what is probably your ideology, but this is not aimed at you. It's aimed at a behavior, not a person. And all of my attacks are attacks on bad behavior not necessarily bad people because people can change people can you know even if it's in a small way but people who seem to think that their mission is to take over existing institutions and uh, basically just just take whatever exists and trash it it, it you know Marxism and all that um, just go in stomp on it use it as a jumping off point for them to continue the revolution or or just so that they can have clout. That's what happens. You start something, you end up like Brendan Eich at, at Mozilla. You know, guy literally created JavaScript. And they uh, forced him to they forced him to resign as CEO before he really even got started over some uh, some sort of like anti-gay marriage donations. I think it was like two grand and poli personal political donations had nothing to do with Mozilla or the business. And that's the problem, is that if you get kicked out, then all that work you put in just goes off and does whatever some friggin' rainbow-haired freak decides, you know, it should do. And it's not going to be in service to the actual point of what you built. Look at Mozilla. What does Mozilla do? Is Mozilla a free, not-for-profit browser whose mission is to... Um, to be, uh, a, a, you know, like an anchor of the free and open internet, to enable access to all, regardless of their ability or background. You know, is Mozilla really this benevolent thing? No. No. You know what I think of? When I think of Mozilla Firefox, I think of, oh, oh, sponsored, sponsored sites, sponsored links, sponsored suggestions in Firefox Suggest. Um, oh, oh, sponsor, uh, uh, suggested by Pocket. You know, um, oh, default search engines, Google, because Google literally pays them hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to have that be the case. You know, Google, Google, the one company that is anti everything Mozilla claims to, to stand for. Yeah, but that, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
yeah, it's just not acceptable. But Mozilla wasn't always like that. If you go back in time, uh, Mozilla converted, it used to be Netscape, and they converted to Mozilla. Um, there was a, um, I can't remember the name of the paper, but they wrote a paper about it, about how they were going to transition to being a free software company. And they released Mozilla, the suite, which was basically Netscape, and they created Firefox from the core of it with a whole new interface, and it was really successful. And yeah, in the beginning, in the beginning, Mozilla.org, Mozi the Mozilla Foundation, you know, all that, they lived up to what they claimed the point was. You know, Firefox was free, open, available for everybody, didn't care, you know, what you thought about the gay, it didn't care, you know, who you were or who gave them money or whatever, it was just a free browser that did a really good job, it was lightweight, it was fast, <coughs> it was clean, it was relatively simplified compared to Netscape, which frankly ha had gotten kind of stale the way that this, the, even just the download dialogues on Netscape are not great, but it it was a clean break from the Netscape UI and, and made a whole new product that really was great. And over the years, it has been tainted and destroyed. And it, it most of the destruction came about as the organization brought on more and more people that were the kind of scumbags that think that they know best, F the users, don't care what the users think. They don't, they're dumb sheep. They don't know what's good for them. Um, so, hey, let's do these interface changes that users don't like. Now, all interface changes are going to be a change that users don't like because you're changing the way that they know how to do things. And some of the interface changes I did eventually decide were okay, but not all of them. I think the interface is shit now, and I hate it. But it's still better than Google Chrome, which is somehow even worse. Firefox is basically trying to look exactly like Google Chrome. They desperately chased Google Chrome, where once Firefox was the thing leading the web. So I look at what happens to things like Firefox, and I'm like, no, there's no friggin' way that I want anybody to be able to get rid of me. I want to be the benevolent dictator for life of the organization. End of story. So nonprofit, completely out. Board, out. Anything that would in any way force me to take any kind of donations that would come with stipulations out. Absolutely, I must not answer to anyone. The bottom line is the product would need to be, you know, independent from the influence of anybody outside the group. Really, it would be need, it would need to be free of any influence other than my own. Um, the people who would eventually work on it with me, or for me, perhaps is a better way to put it, you know, obviously, we would brainstorm, discuss, you know, weigh the merits of things, but that's a decision-making and brainstorming process. That's, that's almost a creative process, and having more input isn't a bad thing there, but ultimately, at the end of the day, I would need to make all the decisions because I have spent an amazing amount of time becoming an expert on how bad everything is. <laughs> I hate to put it that way, but yeah. But... I will admit freely, I have never written an operating system. I did write a multitasking kernel for the 6502. Um, it's under my Codeberg repository. It's called, it's called CO2, C02, um, if you want to check that out. It doesn't really do much, but it is ported to the Nintendo Entertainment System, kind of. So there you go. Um, a little bit, anyway. It can display a message on the screen. But. Uh, I've never written an operating system. I've never written a web browser. Um, uh, these are not things that are in my domain of expertise. My expertise lies, at least in part, in C programming, um, but not necessarily those things. My expertise is in troubleshooting, you know, hardware, software, break, fix, you know, networking. I, I'm sort of a jack of all trades, but that does mean I'm a master of none. I, I am not the best OS programmer because I'm just not really, you know, I have contributed to the Linux kernel in my own small ways. Um, I have uh, contributed to BusyBox. I wrote the undo feature for the VI editor that's in BusyBox. I'm the guy that architected that. Um, but yeah, I've done some things, 
But obviously my expertise is not going to carry a project of such magnitude. I would need to find other people that are at least ideologically clean um, to to join me. Some, you know, I, I can't have people working on it that'll sabotage the project. Some people with the same ideals. Um, so control is extremely important to me. But if I insist on controlling everything, that means that there's a limitation on how I can get money. How would I get money for this thing? Who would invest in something where the top guy is like, but I don't want the investor to have any control? At that point, it's a donation, not an investment. You know, and if the whole point is to make this product and not burn more money than is needed to make the product be a thing, the point isn't to sell the product. The point is to make something that can be given away for free. It's basically charity. But because of the fact that a charity requires a board, I couldn't have a charity. So it would be non-charitable charity. You get the idea. This, this kind of thing is just not... It, the corporate stuff is just not set up for it. Um, and, and two, in the, uh, in the programming side of things, where do you start? You know, do you start writing the kernel first? Do you start writing the browser first? I mean, how the hell would you do that if you don't have anything to write the browser for? Um, do you write the C library? Do, what, what do you do? Do you start from the kernel and work your way up, you know, bottom up? Or do you do a top-down thing where you try to write the applications? Well, to write the applications, presumably, you would need to define the, um, the API for all of your programs. You basically need to de design the C library that you would use. Um, you know, you'd have to design all that stuff first then write the applications for it. But if you're gonna do that before you write the kernel, you've gotta write a compatibility layer that basically maps it to something else like POSIX so that you can at least run your programs on existing systems. Um, and then they're already written for your target system, which doesn't exist yet. You know, where do you start? What do you think, where, where is the best place to begin that? And it almost feels like the only real way to start is to start at the bottom and work your way up. Like, you have to start with the kernel, and everything grows from that. And, I'm, and that's the other thing, is like, a kernel by itself is a 100% useless garbage program that has no value whatsoever. You know, if you can't run anything on the kernel, then the kernel has no point. Um, a kernel without a program to run on top of it is useless. It's about the programs, not the kernel. The kernel is simultaneously the most and least important piece of software. So potential years could be spent just writing a kernel. And I do want to be clear, I don't want to make a system that's POSIX compatible. Because POSIX compatibility is not... I, I think there's enough mistakes made in the way that POSIX is put together define and all that. It, it, it still stems from a time when machines were uniprocessor, you know, time-sharing systems, <clears throat> and it doesn't account for modern parallel processing capacity. You know, should I even do the C language? Should I write my own language? Should I, should I use a different language like Zig or Rust? <coughs> okay, sorry, not Rust. <coughs> uh, sorry, every time I say Rust, it's <coughs> it makes me puke. Uh, but no, should I, should I pick a different language? And there's just so much that goes into just, just the basics of the whole thing. Um, then there's licensing. I don't want to make it um, what we consider free software. I don't want to make it GPL thus making it available for anyone to copy and use, but forcing other people to distribute the source code. Well, I don't want that because I want to also control, at least to some extent, what software other people can write for the system. Because one of my biggest concerns is that I'll write this kernel and I'll write these basic utilities, then some schmuck will come along and beat me to the punch or simultaneously develop their own file explorer, for example. That's my big example, is Windows File Explorer is so great. Well, if I'm, if I'm gonna write a file explorer correctly, I can't have some other guy out there somewhere writing a file explorer for my system incorrectly, getting a bunch of early adopters that go, oh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and now they don't wanna use my properly written one they want to use this other guy's improperly written one 
that say isn't extensible, doesn't have the features, whatever, but they like it because it's got wooshy, wooshy, flashy, flashy animations or something, you know, because users think stuff like that matters. Uh, at least some of them do, you know. Users tend to not care so much about getting actual work done um, as the pretty animation. Like, oh, and Windows, Windows, Windows 11 is so great because it's so, it looks so modern. Well, yeah, but it runs like dog shit. So who cares if it looks so modern, if it runs your stupid browser even worse? And, oh, wooshy, wooshy animations, but it's dog shit. And that's the problem, is I can't have people doing that. I want to make the source code available. I want people to be able to write some software, but I want to reserve certain types of software. Basically, I want to have a license that says, you cannot write this kind of software for this system. And if a, an official one is written, you have to retire what you do write. You know, I, I don't actually want other people outside the organization, at least at first, to contribute software. I want the system to be built properly, which means not building a bunch of garbage that runs on the half-broken system, because once you start stacking all that software on top of the existing choices you've made, now you've amplified the technical debt. You need to proceed slowly and carefully and, and maintain control over things so that your tech debt doesn't become a problem. Anyway, I'm, I'm pretty much out of time. I just can't, I, I can't think anymore about it anyway. It's just, I've run out of things to talk about. Um, I could go deep on that, but I'd love it if some of you could answer some of these questions. If some of you are genius software architects or genius business managers that have gone out and got tons of investment money that you weren't beholden to, boy, I'd love to hear your input. Send me an email, jody at jodybruchon.com. Anyway, like, comment, subscribe, and all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one. Wishy-wishy.